You can tell what you worship by how you try to fill the emptiness inside. Well, welcome to church. It is Sunday and it's the big football day, so mm -hmm. I feel like you should know some some interesting facts about this year's uh, COVID Super Bowl. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that the referees, uh, you're probably used to the fact that they have that yellow flag that they pull out of their belt. Mm -hmm. Well, this year they're also gonna have a little pouch of Purell wipes. <laughs> So, uh, cause they got to wipe down the ball and everything. So if you see a bunch of Purell wipes, it's not bad. It's just gonna right. be a little bit messy. Um, that's football. This is church. So I want to welcome you to church online. My name is Steve. And I'm Sarah. And we are so glad that you're here. You need to know that at Westside, there's no perfect people allowed. So if you're not perfect, you are in great company. Yes. I think you're gonna enjoy the service today. Uh, yes. In fact, in order for you to get the most out of today's service, we want to make sure that you get the resources you need. Yes, so please text the word hello to 503-905-9067, and we're going to send you a link for notes and then also ways to connect, and uh, you, can you can do, do prayer, prayer requests, requests yeah. on there as well. Um, and if you're new with us, make sure that we have a good email address for you because we want to send you an ebook called Sticky Faith, and it's written by our own Pastor Gabe, and it's going to help you on your faith journey. Absolutely. We also have have a couple things coming up. We have growth groups that are happening. It's a great way to get into community. I'm really excited for my yeah, next one. Um, and we have a marriage tune-up on February 19th at 7 p.m. And it's $15 per couple. So you don't want to miss that either. Now we got a special treat for you today. Mm -hmm. uh, at Westside, our mission is to help people find and follow Jesus. And we've got a story today of someone who did just that. Mm -hmm. So let's check that out. I was six, actually, and um, my I went to Liberty Baptist in Montana. My mom and my dad had um, gotten a divorce, and uh, my we went to go live with my grandparents. And my grandparents' rule was uh, on Sundays we go to church. <laughs> the way that I met Jesus was through my grandparents because they were very rooted in in their relationship with Jesus. But when I was six, I remember being in church and I remember uh, the altar call. <laughs> That's how we, how they do it. <laughs> and I remember going up to the stairs and kneeling down with the pastor. And I remember the experience of, um, of knowing that I didn't know what it was that Jesus had for me, but that I was all in. And it's a crazy experience to have when you're six, but I had it. <laughs> From that time on, all the way through my to my young adulthood, Jesus was with me. Like I, he kept me out of the Holy Spirit, kept me out of all kinds of problems. Like told me, just don't be doing that. <laughs> you know, nope, you don't need to be going to that party. You don't need to be involved in that thing. Um, but I remember very clearly at the age of 13, I remember saying, "I'm not interested in this anymore, God." I realized that the struggles that I had are pretty common. Like there's so many families that have been touched with, you know, a, like a drug abuse and alcohol abuse. There are so many families that have been touched by um, physical abuse. There are so many, like those types of things. I was touched by those in my, in my youth. And um, by the time I was 13, I was just bitter and tired. And I was a teenager <laughs> and I kind of just told God to talk to the hand. And I, I remember the moment that I made the decision that I didn't want to be that person anymore and that I wanted to be more accepted by my friends. That led to um, making horrible decisions. And um, I ended up dealing with really, really bad depression. I ended up um, having a daughter at the age of 18, which was rough, it was very difficult. And I, don't get me wrong, I love my, my daughter to death, but it was it was the difficult path to, to take. And my depression was so bad that I couldn't get out of bed <clears throat> in the morning, like to go to work. I almost lost my job. Um, I remember very clearly a time when I was sitting on the stairs of my apartment and my two-year-old daughter came up and told me that she was thirsty and I couldn't get up off the stairs to go meet her needs. And very shortly after that, I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore, God. One of the things that 
that I'd always said as a kid is that I was not going to raise my kids in that same kind of uh, craziness. And so I, um, I had decided that I wasn't ready for relationships and that I needed to figure out how to live life and do things differently. And had met up with a couple of really amazing friends and they brought me to West Side. <laughs> I cried out to God and asked him to, to lift this weight off of my chest of depression and to, to save me because I couldn't do it. The pain that I felt of depression, it's like, it's weird, it's a physical manifestation, it lifted. And I've never really, I've dealt with bouts of depression since then, but it's never been like that. He, he lifted all that stuff off of my shoulders. I had to unlearn a lot of the things that the world taught me. And once I got past that stuff and really like linked into how God wants us to live and how, how God wants me to use my, my time and my space and resources and everything, um, I, I started to, to fill a pool. I started, I started to feel a direction and um, I started to get confidence in who it was that God created me to be. And um, I started to, to like recognize that those things that he, he, that he put in me that made me feel like honestly, like, like a moron or like I didn't belong or, you know, like that I didn't measure up. Like I needed to embrace a lot of those things and realize that, that that's how God created me to be. And once I stopped looking down on those things, I started putting them into action <laughs> and God started using them. And that's my passion now. It's, it's my passion to help people get unstuck and to realize that we aren't what the world creates us to be. We are what God created us to be. What an amazing story. I am so proud of Jessica and that we get to be a part of stories like that. If you have been a part of Westside uh, and supporting the ministry that Westside has been doing over the last number of years, you're a part of Jessica's story. And every time that we give, we are a part of helping people take steps towards Jesus all of the time. In fact, when you give, you support families getting counseling and leaning into their marriage and not out. You support men and women going through recovery or grief support. You, you're you supporting uh, students, boys and girls who are coming together and realizing that they're not alone. So I'm so thankful for every one of you who are so faithful and generous in your support to what God is doing here in this community. And you can right now give, uh, you can give with the link that was in the text message we sent you, or you can go to westsidecommunitychurch.com slash give. And if this is your first time giving, Welcome to the team. Now let's get ready. And we are in part two of Spiritual Growth for Ordinary People. Spirituality is a universal human craving. We were all designed with destiny in mind. And yet, it's easy to assume that spiritual growth comes quicker to some than it does to others. Wouldn't it be nice to find a clear and simple path so you could build your faith and unlock your soul? You're invited into this journey where we can discover the motivation and the practical proven steps for deepening your relationship with God, building a stronger spirit, and living with a greater sense of purpose every day. You can tell what you worship by how you try to fill the emptiness inside. Everyone has it, and we all look for ways to fill ourselves up by different things like being a Buccaneers fan, you know, stuff like that, uh, by wealth, you know, just trying to find uh, money and filling our bank accounts, by fame, looking for, you know, the, the, the feeling that we matter, by achievements or relationships. We all try to fill that emptiness, that void inside, and, you know, that's actually called 
worship, believe it or not. We're going to be talking about that today in our series, Spiritual Growth for Ordinary People, as we discover and explore this topic of filling the emptiness that's inside. You know, worship, that idea of finding that ultimate fulfillment, that's a universal urge. Historically, around the world, there have always been expressions of worship, of people reaching out for something, someone bigger, greater than themselves, the ultimate fulfillment. And I remember just a few years ago, my wife and I were in a little place down in the Yucatan Peninsula on the eastern coast of Mexico and the Caribbean. It's a little place called Tulum. And uh, Tulum was a Mayan village. And we were walking through the tour. The tour guide was telling us that it's interesting how many cultures around the world uh, in the time period that that village was at its heyday in the 12th, 13th century AD, that uh, as many cultures were worshiping the same gods like Venus because uh, there was this urge to go, man, our harvest is good. We should say thanks somehow to whatever it is that's creating this. You know, worship is a universal urge, always has been, always will be. The great human struggle is that nothing seems to be able to fill that emptiness that's inside. And we're going to be talking about how we can find that through Jesus. You know, in John chapter 4, Jesus was walking into a Samaritan village. Uh, He was on the way somewhere. He decided to stop in at the most out-of-the-way place called Samaria. He stopped in to get a drink. He, He walked into this village, and he sits down at this well, and a lady walks up, and he tells this lady, he says, give me a drink. And that starts this discussion in this dry, dusty village as this thirsty lady walks up to the well in the middle of the day, avoiding the crowds uh, because she was such an outcast and she had had a rough life. She had searched for this meaning we're talking about everywhere and still hadn't found it. You know, um, she was still looking for that ultimate fulfillment, the ultimate significance. And it really showed in her life as she had had a string of broken relationships and this is why she was known as the town outcast. Uh, She was just considered a woman that was used and abused, and really um, nobody wanted to be her friend. And, you know, what I've discovered is that people make devastating decisions when they feel empty inside. Devastating decisions. In fact, just here locally in the Beaverton, Oregon area, if you're watching from somewhere outside of our area, welcome. We're glad that you're joining us. I'm excited that you're a part of our church family, and, um, you know, we're just here Uh, looking around our area is probably you are going, wow, some weird stuff, some bad stuff happens. And people make devastating decisions no matter where you're watching from. If you're in our area, just recently on the news, I saw a man fatally shoots himself in front of Washington County Sheriff's Office precinct. Unbelievable. I'm, I'm so sad. When I saw that, my heart just dropped and I thought, man, I can't believe that somebody's life would feel so empty that they would call the police office and and show up there and as the another officer was coming to meet this man just shot himself he he just decided to end his life right there in front of the two officers and it's brutal what happens in our lives when we feel empty inside not only things like suicide horrible act of um you know tragic sadness also things where we we go and we search for something and we we look through every possible avenue to find that ultimate fulfillment. And what I found in really researching this in the Bible this week, that sin is our search for an alternative path to authentic fulfillment. I mean, like we're all looking for the same thing and there's nothing wrong with what we're looking for. We're all looking for filling the emptiness inside. That's the universal human craving. We want that emptiness gone. And when we find it, we are excited. When we think we find it, we keep you know, digging in that same hole, that same direction. And sin is really when we go outside of the path that, that God has provided for us and we're going like, well, I, I can't find it there or I don't want to find it there or I haven't found it there, so I'm going to look somewhere else much like the Samaritan woman in the story that John chapter 4 tells um, had done. my uh, One of my mentors named David Needham, he called sin temporary insanity because when we discover a relationship with God, and I'm not sure where you're at today with that, but when we discover a relationship with God through Jesus, one of the things we find is that he's our source of fulfillment. And 
Anytime we walk away from that, in a way, it's like temporary insanity going like, man, that's crazy. I already know where to go for water. Why would I go someplace else? But hey, it's, it's honestly something that we all struggle with. The question that we all have as we look at our lives is what if I can't stop the leak, you know? I mean, this emptiness, this I fill it up and it's temporary and it leaks out. And then I fill it up and it's temporary and, and it leaks out. What will happen in my life if I can't stop the leak? You know, will I do something really tragic? Will I do something really horrible in my life? Will I go into self-destruct mode if I can't? And in this story where Jesus is with the Samaritan woman, he replied in John chapter 4 verse 10, he said, if you only knew the gift that God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. I mean, that's amazing that, you know, Jesus was sitting there with that woman and in this, you should read John chapter 4, it's an amazing account. In this account, Jesus is going like, hey, look, I actually know who you are. And I know that you are somebody who wants um, to fill the, the void in your soul. And he said, if you knew who I was, you'd know that I could do that for you. In John chapter 4, verse 13, he says this. He says, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. He says, it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now, today we're talking about worship. Worship is in our series, Spiritual Growth for Ordinary People. It's one of the stops along the way of spiritual development. And uh, you know what worship really is? It's simply responding to a restored relationship with our Creator. I mean, it's as though we've finally found someone worthy of our worship in Jesus. And if you're new to or exploring faith, welcome to the idea that everything that you've been looking for in your life is found in a person and his name is Jesus. I want to talk to you today about how to fill your tank for good. And so if you're taking notes, I hope that you are. I hope you grabbed our PDF uh, and, and that you're following along or that you're on the notes on your phone and you're uh, you're ready to just kind of walk along with me. But I, there's a couple of ways you can do this. The first is to let God love you. And it's kind of sounds funny when you think about it that way. Let God love you. When, when you think about your relationship with God, so many times we're just used to uh, the idea that we would have to perform for him. Because if you look across the landscape of historical religion, that's really what religion was. It was a reaching up to God. And what we see in Jesus is a reaching down to us, is a reaching down to us in love, a pulling toward himself of us through Jesus Christ. And that's been his posture ever since Jesus came and walked this earth and gave his life and rose from the dead and said he's coming back, you know. Um, let God love you. It's like with kids, you know, God is really the ultimate perfect parent. And when you think about your kids, if you're a parent, what you know is that there's all these moments in their childhood that bring you joy, you know? That's why you take pictures and that's why you have, you know, video of things and you have Facebook memories pop up and it's like, oh my gosh, I remember that moment when our kids were littler. And uh, I have I have so many wonderful members of my kids. I have three kids, Dawson, Caitlin, Caleb. Uh, they're now 21, 19, and 16. And when Dawson was first born, I mean, I remember the day I held him in my arms for the first time. It was so unbelievable. I couldn't believe I had my own child. My wife and I, we had our own child. And I was just struck with emotion at how special it was. I mean, he didn't need to do anything for me at that point. I loved him not for what he did, but for who he was, the miracle that he was. I remember when my daughter, Caitlin, was little. Um, one of the most like amazing memories I have is of us mowing the lawn together. Crazy. She would be up on my shoulders. I'd be mowing the lawn. And it was just the most amazing thing that that I could have. I had my daughter on my shoulders and she wanted to be with me. And, and it was just, we just, I just wanted her with me. I loved having her with me. It was just amazing. I remember uh, when my son Caleb was little. I mean, he was a firecracker from the get-go. I mean, when, when that kid was born, we knew we were in trouble. We had an energetic Energizer bunny uh, on our hands, and he's been a bundle of joy ever since. And when he was little, he had this bike, and um, we actually still have this bike. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's been used and abused, but um, when he was little, he, he got to ride that bike when he was four years old. He went off in, in their cul-de-sac and was riding his bike with no training wheels. And we were like, what are you doing? How did this happen? 
he goes and he hits the curb and he flies over the handlebars and he, we were like, oh my gosh, our four-year-old just flew over the handlebars on his tiny little bike. And he gets up and dusts himself off, gets back on, rides back off again, and now he's still got this little bike. It's called Major Damage. We should have known when we bought the bike <laughs> what it was going to be like. But you know what? Kids are amazing. And God feels like this about you, to watch you develop through your life. You know, maybe you're taking your first steps in Jesus. Maybe you're, maybe you're being baptized. Maybe you're just getting into groups you're finding out about community. Maybe you're maybe you're further along and you're going like, you know, I'm starting to really realize I have a mission in my life. And, and uh, you know, God looks at that at each step of the way. God is like, I love this phase. I love this phase. Isn't that a fun thought for you to think about? He doesn't wish that you were further along in your development than you are. He is treasuring the moment of watching you learn to tie your shoes, spiritually speaking. You know what I mean? Learn to make your own bed learn to share, all these things that parents, they treasure those moments. And God is the same way with you. You know, when you had kids, if you're a parent, one of the things that was one of the most special moments was just watching our kids sleep as babies. You know, it's like, what can, what are they doing for us? They're not doing anything. That's not the point of having children. The point of having children is that we love them and they don't have to do anything for us to love them. We just love to watch them sleep. And uh, I remember watching my kids sleep. And one of the things that I read in this amazing book, if you've never read it, Purpose Driven Life, so awesome. It says, when you're sleeping, God gazes at you with love because you were his idea. Man, I love that. By the way, parents, please don't miss the rest of this series. We have something very special for you that we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks, and you're not going to want to miss it. But I want to just kind of share with this idea of let God love you. Uh, And so let me read you from Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. It says, For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. I mean, that's how God feels about you. And worship is actually just letting God love you. It's amazing to think about that. Let me share with you one more verse. It's from Psalm 81, verse 10. And it really is a reflection of the children of Israel who had been wandering around in the wilderness before they got to the promised land. And they were learning, you know, what is it like to trust uh, and love God and to let him love us? Part of the way they learned that was by him feeding them Um, you know, like this manna and it would drop on the ground every day and they were supposed to pick it up and that was like their food, right? And and, and it's kind of like if you picture a a mother bird and a baby bird, you know, and if you've ever seen that nest where the mother bird comes back to the nest with food, what do the baby birds do? I mean, they're just like, uh, you know, they're wide open mouths. They're just waiting for their mother to drop a worm or something in there. They know where good things come from. They know where their provision comes from. They know that uh, when mom comes back to the nest, it's, it's a good thing. And God tells the children of Israel in Psalm 81, verse 10, and this really applies to you and me too. It says, for I was the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt. You know, in that time they were in between. And he says, open your mouth wide and I'll fill it with good things. I've got things for you in your life, provision for you. I've got hope for you. I've got a plan for you. I've got love for you. This is what God wants for you and me. He's saying, I'm, I'm your God. I, I love you. Would you let me love you? Old things have passed away. Your love has seen the same. Your constant grace remains the Stone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. You cause your sun to shine on darkest nights for all.
amazing. God loves you so much, and we got to learn to let him love us. That's a part of worship. The second part of worship is this, is to learn to love him. And uh, if you remember that story from John chapter four, it's the woman who is going to this well. She's thirsty. She needs um, you know, a break really in her life. She's been looking her whole life for fulfillment. And she's starting to have this sense in this conversation with Jesus that he might be a, a secret for her. He might be a part of this puzzle for her. And in John chapter four, verse 23, Jesus says, the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He says the Father, God the Father, is looking for those who will worship him that way. He's saying worship is a part of your spiritual existence. It's a part of your journey. And actually God, as he sent Jesus to this earth, he's been seeking what he would call worshipers. Now, I mean, that might sound a little vain if you really pause and think about it, because it's like, well, gosh, how how self-focused you know focused do you have to be to go like, I'm going to create all of these little beings so that they can worship me. But I think that's the wrong That's not an accurate description of what worship is to God because what worship is is a loving relationship. And if you think about God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit who existed long before people were created in a perfectly satisfying, loving relationship, we call that the Trinity. What worship is is really an invitation for you and me to step inside of that circle and to experience the fullness of love. That that's why worship is so important. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, we learn from Jesus, he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. It's as though Jesus was not leaving out any possibility of a way that you could love the Lord, that you could express your love to the Lord. And so if worship is really a response of a restored relationship with God, then it's that loving him in every way. Not only do we let him love us, now we learn to express back, to love him back in that way. Like, of course, it's, we were talking about parenting. We're talking about parents and kids. It's, of course, one of the most amazing things we can ever experience is when our kids love us back, you know? Not because they have to, but because they want to. And that very same thing, that is worship. It's in that moment when God knows that we're receiving our ultimate fulfillment from him. And we're giving him that gratitude and having that moment of connection and communion with him that we were created for, and it brings him glory. That is worship. And there's a lot of ways you can worship. I made a little list. Um, I mean, there's, there's working, there's singing, there's reading, there's praying, there's creating, there's being silent, there's being still, there's learning, there's exercising, there's fasting from food, like giving up food, there's giving things or money. There's serving, there's sharing your faith, there's listening to somebody, there's being baptized, there's taking communion, there's obeying, there's welcoming a stranger, there's feeding the hungry, I mean, there's opening their home. The list is endless, right? There's so many ways we can worship. Sometimes we think, oh, worship, yeah, I know what worship is, it's that time in the church service when we when we sing, right? Like, that is one, one, it's only one way to worship. And even as we experience uh, something as beautiful as somebody painting a beautiful picture as an expression of her love uh, and, and seeing that, that's, that's a worship act, right? I mean, we can worship God in so many ways. And one of the ways that we can do that is we can even be getting involved. You know, if you think about your own life and we're on this journey, even taking your next step of spiritual development, that is an act of worship. In fact, I love what somebody said. They said, every act in humanity, except sin, can be done for God's pleasure if you do it with an attitude of praise. So it's not about necessarily what you do, it's about why you do what you do that determines is this act an act of worship or not. And I'm teaching all of this because I I care so deeply about where you go as a person. I care so deeply about, are you satisfied deep down in your soul, you know? Do you have an emptiness that's driving you or do you have a fullness that's driving you? Because that is a huge difference in your life. And if you're not sure, I wanna urge you today to lean into your relationship with God, go past all the meaninglessness of these things that are just gonna leak back out and let's go to a higher level of living. I love what uh, I read this week in studying. I I read this thing, said your wisest moments will be when you say yes to God. (laughs) That's gonna be your wisest moments because that's what we talked about, sin. Sin is when we go outside of this relationship with God to kind of go, 
you know, maybe it's because we haven't seen it happen. We got, maybe we got burned in through a relationship with God or, or th- what we thought was burned. Maybe we were confused. Maybe we never were taught that. But somehow we're going outside of that original creative moment that God had when he made us for him and he made us to have a relationship with him. And then we're going outside of that to go, I, I, hey, all I want is fulfillment. There's nothing wrong with that. But when we go outside of that and, and look for it in ways that are destructive to us, like the woman at the well who had burned through all these relationships, I and mean, there's shrapnel everywhere in her life from relationships gone wrong. Man, haven't we all done some of that? And, you know, that hasn't, has it solved our problem? No, we're still feeling that feeling of emptiness. It still leaks out. And so um, I hope that this will be the moment you walk forward. Now, we've talked about this diagram, this little uh, last week. If you did, if you missed our, our talk last week, go back and watch it. If you would on our YouTube channel, I hope you will. But um, we showed this little diagram and it talks about a spiritual pathway. It's kind of like climbing mountains and, and it's really three parts. It's worship, it's community, it's mission. And worship is really the environment where personal transformation begins, okay? It's, it's, it's personal transformation begins in worship. It's that when we meet Jesus, when we come into contact with the God of the universe who has forgiven us of our sins, like the woman at the well, um, we, 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 are tra- we start to be transformed. And if you're wondering about spiritual growth, how do I move? The question to ask is, have I moved into a place where I'm in a relationship with my creator? That very first place of worship. Community, that second environment, that's the environment where your transformation begins to grow and evolve. And, and you really start to see it expand. It's an exciting place to be. You're with other people. You're doing this together. You're kind of, they're the glue that help, that holds you to this process. It's very exciting. We're gonna be talking more about that next week. I hope that you'll be with us. Mission, that's the environment where your, your transformation comes to maturity because you're starting to hand it off to somebody else. And so I wanna give you here in this first stop along the way, worship. How do you do that practically speaking? Because we can say all day long, you should worship, I should worship, let's worship. But what are we really talking about? I'm gonna give you the top three tips really for worship. And the first one is this, is constant conversation. <laughs> That's like, you might wanna think of it as prayer. First Thessalonians 5, 17 says, never stop praying. I mean, this is what God created us for. Can you imagine being in a relationship with maybe a parent or maybe a spouse where uh, you you barely ever talked, you know? And uh, what would we call that? We would call that like not a healthy relationship, uh, but in a good, healthy marriage, as an example, um, there's constant conversation, you know? There's a text going back and forth, you know, can't wait to see you tonight. There's there's that, hey, did you know, is the laundry done? Or, you know, all those things, that's all communication, constant conversation. And God cares about the text, about the laundry. He cares about everything. He wants to hear the, I love you as you're, you know, leaving the house in the morning. He wants to hear the, um, hey, can you help me out? He wants to hear all of that constant conversation. Paul teaches us, don't ever stop talking to your heavenly father. That constant conversation, that's worship. That will grow your transformation in this thing called worship. I mean, worship is something that needs to happen 24 seven. It's designed to happen 24 seven, 365. Not while you're sitting in front of a screen for a church service, not while you're in a building for a church service, Your whole life is designed to be an act of worship. The second tip is this, is continual meditation. And when I talk about meditation, I'm really talking about, you know, continual meditation on God's word, that we would be people that go, hey, God has a message for us. It's this love letter he's written to us, and and he wants us to be able to to go over it and over and over it. I mean, uh, Melissa and I, we started dating real young, and so we have all of these letters that we've written to each other. In one of my Bibles, I have this letter that she wrote to me um, 26, 27 years ago. And I very often pull that letter out and I read it and I'm reminded how much she loved me then, how much she loves me now. And um, it's the same thing with God's word is that we would go, ooh, I wanna, I wanna be reminded of his love for me, his plan for me, his direction for me, his thoughts about me and my life and how I can succeed. And you know, I love what David says in, in Psalm 19. He says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. He's going, man, I want to med- I want this to fill me up. Would you please put your word, your thoughts in me so I can meditate on them continually because that's going to drive me into more of communion with you, which is the purpose of my life. The last one is this, is 
quick confession. <laughs> quick confession. Like, and the reason why I put quick confession is because you and I are all, all of us, doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you're doing, how long you've been following Jesus, or whether you're just starting, um, you're going to mess up. I'm going to mess up. Um, there's a good chance that right, as soon as we're done with this gathering, uh, it won't be long. I'm going to mess up on something, and it's going to be a thought. It's going to be a word. It's going to be an act. Something's going to go wrong. I'm going to do something wrong. And and and, it, and sometimes I'll be like, oops, I didn't know. But other times I'll be like, yeah, I know. I shouldn't have done that. And what God tells us in 1 John 1, 9 is if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. He puts it right again in our lives. That's how we stay in that place of continual worship because we haven't let it drift, you know? We haven't gone a week or a month or a year or a decade with distance in our relationship with the creator that loves us so much he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for us and bring us back. And that is what that lady discovered in John chapter 4. I mean, she's all of a sudden sitting there realizing who she's talking to, coming with this emptiness in her soul and going, oh, wow, I think I just met the one who can fill it. In John 4, 28 through 30, it says this, it says the woman left her water jar beside the well <laughs> and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me Everything I ever did, could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. I love it. This lady came to the well for what? Water. She meets Jesus, forgets about the water. Her whole soul is transformed. She's filled up on the inside. The emptiness in her soul is filled. She forgets she was ever even physically thirsty, gets so excited about that new relationship she just received from Jesus, runs back to the village and goes, you guys got to meet this guy. And uh, what we find in scripture is that when Jesus enters into your life, transformation begins. That's worship. And if you've never had that moment where Jesus has done that for you, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Would you bow your heads right where you're at and pray this with me? Tell him right now. Tell him, Jesus, today I'm receiving the same thing that that lady received. I want your love. I want your forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask that you would come into my life like you did hers. Make me alive again. Make me new again. Thank you that I can be in relationship with you. Help me to learn to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you gave your life to Jesus today, we want to walk with you. So would you text the word Jesus to 503-905-9067 so we can be taking steps with you. We'd love to do that with you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for Church Online today. Hopefully you were encouraged and that this is going to be a great week. Make sure that you subscribe to our Westside Weekly and also you can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you found today helpful, consider bringing somebody back with you to join you for Church Online next week when we go into part three of Spiritual Growth for Ordinary People. Hey, Westside family, Stacy here. Are you looking for ways to keep your kids engaged in kids' ministry? We've got two options for you. Our first is on-demand content, which you can find on our kids' ministry website page. There you will see that we've got lessons and videos posted for three age groups, preschool, kindergarten to third grade, and our Club 45, fourth and fifth graders. Our second option is a Facebook group. Every Sunday we post the video for that week, and then every day that week we will have additional information for you to use as a family to reinforce what your children have learned on Sunday. Hey, Westside students, Tim Wooten here, student ministry director. Hey, I want to encourage you right now to jump online. Go to westsidecommunitychurch.com forward slash students for today's lesson. You're going to want to check that out. Hey, if you want to join us in person every Sunday morning right here at our campus at 10 and 1130 a.m., you can come join me and the rest of the team and the rest of your fellow students here at our campus. Come join us.